So the Red Cross is a universally recognized brand, and it's only second to what other brand is out of curiosity? Salvation Army. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola actually is the most most popular brand in the world, but the Red Cross is second to that. So we, the Red Cross does a lot, and I know people hear about what the Red Cross does in the news, mostly internationally, national relief, but we are very much have a local presence here in our communities. Uh, a lot of domestic disaster relief, again, preparedness, um, health and safety programs, who's CPR first aid certified? I bet Brett probably you are. But so a few hands in the room, that's always good to see. Um, international relief and then uh, support to our military. So here's an overview of the Red Cross, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our chapter. We do have a chapter here in Tacoma. It's on South Tacoma Way. Um, we just painted it this lovely blue. It used to be pretty decrepit looking and old and we wanted to make sure that people knew that we were there, so we did have it recently repainted. Our chapter um, covers 8,500 square miles. Uh, it covers Pierce, Thurston, Mason, Lewis, and Grace Harbor counties. Of that, uh, we have only 11 full-time staff. Uh, we currently have eight AmeriCorps, uh, but we have more than 250 volunteers, and we could not do the work that we do without the work of our volunteers. Uh, this last fiscal year, uh, we responded to about 1,200 disasters within our uh, Mount Rainier territory, and we've logged more than 25,000 miles, 25,000 hours. Um, I really like this slide too because it's pretty straightforward. 91 cents of every dollar that's raised goes towards the mission of the American Red Cross. So another interesting slide, if you can read the stats here, um, it shows that between 2001 and 2010, the number of disasters have increased almost fivefold. And these stats were taken even before Hurricane Sandy happened. So you can see that um, disasters are increasing. We can say a lot of reasons as to why they are, and we can't control Mother Nature, but we certainly can help be a little bit more prepared. So Mark talked about this in the intro. The Red Cross does have two mandates from Congress. Does anyone have any idea what those two mandates are? So one of them is uh, our mandate to uh, respond to disasters, uh, locally, nationally, and internationally. And a lot of people are very familiar with the Red Cross and what they do. They know when a big disaster happens that the Red Cross is going to be there. The second mandate from Congress, which obviously is um, near and dear to my heart, is what we do with service to armed forces. So we play a tremendous role uh, in our partnerships with the military. And that primarily comes through the communication program process that's needed. If, it's a, if something were to happen at home to you, and you had uh, someone who was enlisted in the military downrange, and you needed to respond to, you needed to get in touch with them right away, the Red Cross provides that service. And we have a very close relationship uh, with General Brown and General Lanza on Joint Base Lewis McCord. And I did have the opportunity to ask them, so is this, is this just legit, this service, this messaging? And he, uh, one of the uh, command sergeant majors there said, actually, Tracy, this is what I do. If, if we're downrange overseas and they get a call and they say this is a Red Cross and so-and-so soldier and this is the message, he'll say, okay, great, what's your number? Um, he'll write it down, hang up the phone and pick it up. Um, just to ensure it is a Red Cross message, because once they know it's a Red Cross message, it's actually very, very legit. Um, it's up to their discretion as to whether or not they want to send a soldier home. Um, but it goes to show that sometimes people try to use the Red Cross messaging, and that, that doesn't always work very well. Um, but it just shows the credibility of the Red Cross and the partnership that we have there. Um, we also do a lot with the, the wives, uh, the spouses when the their servicemen or women are deployed overseas, and we also partnered with Army Source One. I don't know if any of you are um, retired military. Army Source One is uh, like the 211 of the military. Anything and everything you would need to know, and the Red Cross provides some financial uh, counseling for military members and their families. Um, as you can see, we have a number of uh, volunteers that are 
serving at Joint Base Lewis McCord, Madigan Army Medical Center, and also our naval base. <coughs> so Hurricane Sandy. Uh, so it's been 11 months since Hurricane Sandy literally slammed into our East Coast. 11 states were affected. Um, of course, New York and New Jersey being the hardest hit. We knew it was coming. So because of that, we were able to actually deploy volunteers from across the states to be ready and stationed. Did we know it was going to be as bad as it was? Absolutely not. Um, from our chapter alone, uh, which includes the region of Seattle, we sent more than 131 volunteers. And we also sent our emergency response vehicle. We had it driven, and these are all volunteers. And they go for about two weeks to three weeks at a time. If they'd like to stay longer, they certainly can. Um, what's interesting about this are some older facts. Um, nearly um, a million persons applied for assistance, and more than 50% of those households had income of less than $40,000 a year. So imagine that because of where you live, your house was literally destroyed, <coughs> you have not a whole lot of income, and now it's not just you, it's you, it's you and thousands and thousands of people who are homeless. So the Red Cross, partnering with FEMA and other organizations, we really have a huge challenge on our hands as to how to deal with Hurricane Sandy, and mostly the displacement of persons from their homes. So uh, these are just some pictures that I want to share from Hurricane Sandy. And what I like about these pictures is that these were taken by one of our volunteers who was deployed over there. Uh, here she is in, uh, this is, uh, I don't remember exactly where she was. Uh, this was taken last November. This was Staten Island, New York. Uh, this was once a beautiful home on the beach of Long Island. And here's a, a great before picture. Looks lovely, peaceful, very nice. And certainly not anymore. These are just some of the facts, um, stats, that the Red Cross was able to provide. Uh, immediately, we had boots on the ground, and we were doing the best that we could with what we had. And again, it was thousands of dollars sent over there. Um, a lot of that was. Um, food, a lot of that was um, just basic needs, and when you lose everything and you have nothing, um, sometimes when someone even just gives you a hug, it helps. These are some of the additional pictures of the Red Cross providing some relief, and again, these are pictures taken by our local volunteers. Unfortunately, it started to snow, which I'm sure didn't help the situation very much. This is actually our volunteer uh, here, her name is Tracy, also. And she is um, unloading, you can see the American Red Cross truck and some of the food that they're unloading. This is one of the warehouses and just putting together hand warming kits. <clears throat> if you were living in New York or New Jersey at the time and lost your home, this is what your temporary shelter would look like. Uh, we provide cots and we open shelters and we provide food. Um, it probably wasn't the most comfortable, and um, imagine if you and your family had to stay in there for weeks on end, um, displaced from a whole lot of things. So I'm sure it wasn't um, an ideal situation, but I can tell you those people were extremely grateful that the Red Cross was there. And this is just some additional pictures of supplies being dropped off. And this is a, a warehouse full of jackets that was provided by, um, I believe it was Macy's, shipped these over and we were just able to hand them out. Uh, another delivery truck in the Red Cross. So we know we're in it for the long haul. Um, our work at Hurricane Katrina has lasted for more than six years. Uh, we're still in uh, Joplin, Missouri, helping those victims that are over there. And sometimes what we find is you can get over the emotion, you can get over the initial disaster, but there's also a lot of emotional disaster that goes with that. And one of the services that Red Cross also provides is that emotional support. We do have a lot of uh, mental health counselors. So um, 
long-term recovery, that's what the Red Cross is, is in this uh, particular situation with for Hurricane Sandy. So we learned a lot um, from Hurricane Sandy. And I think we learned some things to do well, but I also think we learned um, to do some things better. But what we also learned, and we're focusing on a lot more, is that few are actually truly prepared. And when I say that, quick show of hands, who has a disaster kit ready to go in their house? Marv should raise both hands. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, that's good to see that. Um, how many of you have a disaster kit in your car? Probably the same people that have a disaster kit at home. <laughs> how many of you have a disaster kit that you know of in your office? And it does, I don't mean like a little first aid band aid kit. Okay, so not a whole lot. So the, the reality is, is that we probably rely a whole lot upon 911 and our, our emergency responders. Um, but we can't do that because if a big disaster were to happen, they're going to be really, really busy and it's going to take a while for them to get to you. So what we're really focusing on now is we want, we want our residents, we want our communities, we want you and we more importantly want you and your families to be prepared. So some interesting facts about Washington State, think about this tonight when you're talking with your family about your disaster kit. Uh, Washington rate, state ranks second only to California for states susceptible to very damaging and large earthquakes. Uh, there have been 21 presidentially declared disasters in Washington State in the past 20 years. I didn't know that. Um, and who, business owners, I see a few business owners here in the room. Small business owners especially, if a large disaster were to happen, stats have shown consistently that 40% of businesses close their doors and are never able to open them again when big disasters happen. Primarily, they're not prepared and their employees aren't prepared. So when their employees aren't prepared, and this goes for any business, they're not gonna come to work. So how are you supposed to open up your doors if your employees are not there? Um, <clears throat> uh, we also are, that's probably my phone, right? Yeah. Good thing it's not ringing because it'd be like, what, $50? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably my children calling me. The 18-year-old, Mom, where are you? Um, we, did, we live in a very beautiful state, but just be conscious of, oh, I think it's my alarm. <laughs> it, will, it will keep going on. Uh, yeah, thank you. I apologize for that. Thank you. Um, it's just important to know that we do live in a be very beautiful part of the country, but we're also going to be we're extremely susceptible to um, Mount Rainier if it were to ever blow, touch wood it wouldn't. We've got some awesome lahars that would come right through here, and of course uh, the earthquake that I had mentioned before and the possibilities of that. Uh, so the Red Cross has put together a program called Red Cross Ready, and that's exactly what we want you to be, is, is Red Cross Ready. It's really easy to make a kit, get a kit, make a plan, and be informed. So we know that if you're prepared before disaster happens, the chances of you recovering are much, much greater. <clears throat> to take that even further, as Mark <coughs> mentioned, we have a program within our region, which includes Seattle, Kitsap, and the Mount Rainier chapter, um, safe in the sound. And this is our way of really making it clear to you that this is a preparedness plan for you because you live here in the Puget Sound area. And so what we're looking to do is actually change the vision and the culture of preparedness. And I think the best example I can give of trying to change the culture is if you were to think about where we were with recycling 10 years ago, it was a nice thing to do um, if you wanted to do it, you could, and it was great for the planet. If you don't recycle today, you're almost somewhat frowned upon, like, what do you mean you don't recycle? You have to recycle, it's good for the planet. So we're trying to really change the culture of organizations, companies, individuals, and families to really think about preparedness as that's just the norm. And we're also uh, focusing on our vulnerable population. Um, not everyone is capable of responding to a disaster 
uh, persons uh, with English as a second language, maybe persons uh, who don't have that financial income, also persons with disabilities, uh, and then um, our youth and also um, our elderly are areas that the Red Cross is focusing on. So if you were to take a gander, we're talking about earthquakes now, how many earthquakes do we have in the last two weeks? Just two hundred. So I, I, I've heard eight, yeah, and I heard two hundred. So the gentleman who said two hundred was the closest. Mm. We had one hundred and thirteen earthquakes, and we don't really think about that, um, but we probably should uh, because we have some pretty big faults. We have the Seattle faults. We have the uh, Nisqually. Everyone remembers when that Nisqually earthquake happened a few years ago. Who was here for that? And so the earthquake happened, and I think there was the moment before the, the that calm moment, moment before the storm hit, and then all of a sudden, everyone picked up the phone and tried to get in touch with their loved ones. And you couldn't get through to anyone, anywhere. And I don't know if you remember that, but I remember cell phones were just kind of coming out at the time, and, and landlines. Um, that, that was the panic of, oh my god, uh, what do I do? And that wasn't even a big earthquake. And so these are things that we want you to think about uh, in preparation of an earthquake. If an earthquake happens, what do you do? Yes, drop cover and hold on. Um, really important, you don't want to run underneath a door jam <laughs> because, I'll just give an example, if there was a door jam in here, and there's how many of us in this room? We would all be running for the door jam and it just wouldn't work. So we just want you to drop cover and hold on. And I think it's just natural instincts that you do that. Um, if an earthquake happens in the middle of the night, don't get up and run around. We want you to actually stay in your bed and put a pillow over your head. And make sure to tell your children this too. Stay in your bed, put a pillow over your head. And it's always really important too to have good shoes underneath your bed because glass and all that not fun things that happen if a really big earthquake were to happen. Just some other things <coughs> to think about in the beautiful Puget Sound that we live in. Uh, we are susceptible to a lahar if our lovely Mount Rainier were to, to blow. That's a picture of Mount Rainier and of course of Mount St. Helens. Um, these are some pictures of the windstorm and winter storm and flood. Uh, these were, the middle picture is of Seattle, the one on the right is also Seattle, and the one on, uh, that would be my left, your right, uh, is the flood, and that flood was the flood that happened in Lewis County, uh, yeah, not too long ago. Again, another one that completely just took us by utter surprise, and we were literally cut off, and that's one of the, in your chapter's counties is Lewis County. And then house fires. House fires is actually what the Red Cross responds to on, we respond to that disaster the most. And typically for our chapter, it happens every 48 hours, and for our region, it happens every 16 hours. How this works is a house fire is happening, let's say here in Tacoma, Pierce County. Uh, 911 is called, the fire department is dispatched, they go to the scene, they see the house is totally engulfed. They talk to the family, do you have any place to go? Sometimes they do, more often than not, um, certain pockets of this community, they don't have a place to go. They in turn call the Red Cross, who dispatch our disaster action team members, which are volunteers that serve on a rotation just like the fire department does. It doesn't matter if it's 2 a.m. or 2 p.m. They go out, they talk to the family, and immediately, if they need to, they will put them in a hotel room, they will get them food for they will give them money for food, for clothes, if they need their prescriptions refilled, if they need their, their pets put somewhere. And then the next day we actually call them to make sure that they're doing okay if they need mental health casework. We have those persons that help them. And in the long run, we're actually able to, if need be, um, provide a, down, a deposit for them to get into uh, a house. So we hold their hands throughout the entire process. 
Um, we talked about this a little bit. Um, prepare yourself, your family, and your home. If you were, how much time do I have? Okay, so this is going to be really fast and it's going to be interactive and then I'll wrap it up. Mm -hmm. So you're at home and it's 7 p.m. and you're having dinner with your family and um, Cheryl comes to your door and says, I'm sorry, you have to vacate your home immediately. Um, Mount Rainier is going to explode and um, you have five minutes and the truck will be here out front to pick up you and your neighbors. What would you bring with you? Photographs. Go. You have five minutes. Go. Critical documents. Okay. I'm, I'm hearing good things so far. Rotary 8 said wine. <laughs> this sounds like a word of wine. So I'm, I'm hearing critical documents. That's good. Um, someone said a purse. Clothes. Okay, clothes. Cash. Yeah. Cash. cash. Water. Water, Water, cash. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Radio. Oh, what kind of radio? radio? Okay, hand crank radio. Yep. So you would survive. You would do great. We got it. You probably have an emergency kit at home as well. That's the type of situation that you never want to come across as the, uh, what, it, what, what do I do? I have no idea what to do, and your kids have no idea what to do, and your wife is frantically running around, or your husband is frantically running around. That's why it's really important to be prepared, have an emergency kit at home, so it's packed, it's ready to go. And in that emergency kit, you probably 